Good afternoon, everybody. Sorry to give you a fright there. <laughs> um, my name is Rosie Modena, and I'm going to be moderating this session. Um, on my right, we have Commissioner Angie McGregor, who's written this amazing book called Femicide. And then we have Dr. Judy Glamini, who wrote the foreword of the book. Before we go into the session, uh, because the subject matter is incredibly important, but it can be incredibly triggering and sensitive, uh, just to let you know, if anybody does want to speak to me afterwards, I was trained for power, and if you need to debrief or just express or you need assistance, um, whether it's counseling or you know somebody um, that is there, and also just to, to try and create the space that if you do feel that you're gonna be triggered, or, and that includes the three of us sitting on stage because the issue with, with gender-based violence is that you can get triggered at any point. It doesn't make, make you weak. It doesn't make you strong. It makes you stronger, sorry. But um, if that does happen, uh, I will allow that pain and if you just take a few moments and just you know, feel what you're going through because also for so many years we've been told we're rocks. And yes, we're strong, but we're also sensitive. We're emotional creatures. So if you do see something happening, whether it's even one of us, just allow the pain to, 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 to flow wherever it goes. It's, you know, and, and if it means us taking a break for a couple of minutes, so be it. But, but we are all in a space where we all need healing because gender-based violence has affected us in some way or the other. Some, some a lot more than others, but, but in, you know, the reality is, is that it's not just a woman's problem, it's not just something that happens to a certain demographic and so forth. So with opening of the book, um, of, of the session, thank you so much ladies. Um, it is an absolute honor, um, you know, literally sitting amongst two phenomenal, powerful giants of, of, of our country. So I'm really, really honored. Thank you very much. Um, so I went to the, the launch of, of, of Femicide and when I go to a book launch I don't, I tend to not really read up about the book because I want to see what's going to be happening at the launch. And one thing that I was amazed about, and, and it's an issue that happens in our country, is that not all families, but a lot of our older generation, when we did reach out and say, well, you know, you're going through the abuse, we were always told to push it under the carpet, keep quiet, let's not talk about it, don't air your dirty laundry and so forth. And so I commend both of you because as, as leaders, not only leaders in our country, but also as our elders, it is so important to have this discussion, especially coming from your standpoint. So to open up the discussion, um, I'd like to, 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 to start with Dr. Judy Glamini on, on the forward. And why you, I mean, we know why that you, you, you needed to, 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 to add value to this book and so forth, but, but why, where, 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 is you, where, where do you stand in your opinion in terms of addressing these issues in the way you did it in the, in the forward? Can you hear me? Okay, great. Thank you so much for coming as a start. It's rainy, and uh, thanks for coming to our session. And thanks, Rosie, and uh, thanks. My biggest gratitude is to the uh, Commissioner and to my question, because this is very personal. It's very personal pain. As you can remember, at the launch, the family was there. The contributors to the book were there, and they read a section of their um, chapter. Why did I write the forward? Why get involved with this book at all? Because it is so necessary. We have a crisis in this country where women and children are killed. And we need to do something and something urgently. And it has to be a multi prong approach, a multidisciplinary, because you find that when you come to talks like this, you actually find a lot more women than men. And I want to thank the men that are here. And yet women don't kill themselves. We have challenges as a country, men and women. So I actually embraced 
the idea of getting involved at all uh, regarding uh, the book. And in the foreword, I just try to paint a picture of where we are as a country when it comes to femicide, when it comes to gender-based violence. It goes further than that because people think gender-based violence is only physical, yeah, emotional, yeah. in terms of bodily, uh, physical. But those that are in the corporate know that there is a lot of abuse in the corporate where a woman is seen as less than a man. You have instances, and a lot of them, where you find that a woman takes over a position that was occupied by a man, and then they downgrade her position and the salary goes down. She achieves more, she actually has to do more to even end the position, but yeah, so I just felt we need to talk about these issues for them to be sorted out. Yeah, that's um, Commissioner, in, in, the, in the chapter um, called An uh, Answer Count, you quoted the and I'm going to read out the quote, and it said, I will take the time to give and prepare myself for the change. Let's talk about that because it is so heavy. I mean, when you grieve somebody, that is already a lot of pain and a lot to carry. But when you grieve somebody, and in your case, two family members from such traumatic events, where do you even begin? How do you even begin? Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for being here. And thank you, Rosie, for the opportunity. Now, talking about grieving, there are two women on the cover of the book. Um, the one on that one that I'm pointing at, that's my niece, a beautiful young woman who was killed by her husband. And then the other one is my youngest sister. So my sister was killed a year after my mom passed away. And, and, and I think it was just a blessing that my mother did not see her favorite child being killed that way. And you know, where, you know how uh, friends and families come to come and pay their condolences one of my mother's friends said to us, yo, I can see you guys are really hurt. She said, when we buried your mother last year, you were fine because my mother was 83 and we accepted that she had to go. But when Antoinette, my sister, was killed very brutally, stabbed 15 times by her husband, we were finished. We did not know what, we didn't even know how to console the children because we ourselves were dealing with the shock, with this grief. And what is also said is that this man then ran away. And for about a month, the police could not find him. And at that time, Uno Gula Mokanyane was MEC for, for safety. I even had to try and enlist her help. But you know who caught this culprit, this killer? The women in the, in the complex of flats where they lived. They made a citizen's arrest. So to go back to your question, uh, Rosie, I don't even know what advice I would give to a family that is grieving from a case of femicide, because it should not happen. Women should not be killed by men that are supposed to love and protect them. Thank you very much for that. Um, in the book, uh, there are, it's beautiful, but it's also chilling. There are testimonies from the children from both, and testimonies from, from, from members of the family. Um, and, and I say it's beautiful because there's power in that level of healing. Why did, you, why did you decide to choose that type of narrative structure? Because some of the stories, some of the, the, the testimonies I I went back to read again. Because it was a little bit too hurtful, and then I went back, and then you find the beauty and the meaning in that. Let's discuss that narrative structure. Yeah, you see, the main, the main reason why I decided, decided to put my family's pain in writing, remember that my sister was killed in 2001. My niece was killed in 2004. And I thought, uh-uh, 
It looks like Dendro is a strayer. It looks like it will keep coming back to the family. And I then decided to put it out there. I just said, no, femicide, you do not belong to my family. So I put it out there, I put it in writing, but also to say it is not a shame. It is not something that women bring upon themselves. And to say, let us share. In fact, Rosie, when I started, uh, when I planned the book, I was going to speak to other families, but then I thought, no, no, let's deal with this family. So there's an account from my sister, whose, whose daughter got killed. And the, my sister, by the way, I could not interview. It was very difficult for me. So when I discussed it with Dr. Judy, who is my publisher, she said to me, leave it to me, I'll see if I can interview her. And bless her soul, she summoned sufficient courage to go all the way to Kutso in Caltonville to interview my sister. And that is why the story is in the book. And then um, I had, of course, to get permission from the entire family because, you know, I was going to, to reveal a whole lot of things that had happened in the family. So the children, to them also, I think it was part of healing to say, yes, I recall, and this is what has happened. And when you read, particularly my niece, Berlin, who has turned out beautifully, she got married to a very nice young man, and you know, she talks about how the trauma of living in this very dysfunctional community. I was in Dr. T's session that, that side, and she was talking about apartheid and how we were segregated into colored and African, when my family was then segregated into colored. So she got married into a colored community in Westbury, which was very dysfunctional, which is still very dysfunctional. Because the other day I went to the library in Westville and, and I discovered that it was right opposite the place where my sister got killed. It is still the same. You still see young people hanging around. There is nothing for them to And this thing is a cycle. It is a vicious cycle. Children that see violence become violent themselves especially if they see the father assault the mother. They, they have this anger that is bottled up. And then when they become men themselves, particularly the boy child, when they become men themselves, they think that is the right way of sorting out issues in the family. They then become very violent. Another thing is corporal punishment. You know, corporal punishment is illegal in this country. However, we still have a lot of work to do. We have to teach parents positive parenting, positive discipline. However, when a parent beats a child, we say it's, it's discipline. So, thanks, thanks. We call it discipline. And yet, with two adults, it's violence. Violence is violence. Whether it's on a child or on an adult, it is violent. So we have to keep teaching one another, each other, to say, sing about shy about brother. Let's find the ways of discipline. Because sometimes they get busy up by teachers. And then we wonder why there's violence in schools. Because children will then take it out either on teachers or take it out amongst themselves. Yes, it's also glamorized and romanticized in the media and, yes. and entertainment and so forth. And um, tapping on what you said before, now, um, his name was Stuart. 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 Um, so when, 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 when he committed the crime, he ran away. So as we know, abusers are cowards. Um, and as Mayor Aji just said, that it was a citizen's arrest by the woman in a community that got him, that got him arrested. Mm. Dr. Judy, let's talk about the aspects of how our judicial system is failing us. Because not only was he incarcerated, he was then let out early on parole. And this is the norm that happens in our country. 
It's so true, Rosie. I think you served, what, five years, seven years? Yes, so seven, seven, seven years, yes. yes. Uh, we have problems in more areas than just the judiciary. I think it starts at societal level. This gender role and stereotyping is the beginning of our problems. Where for a boy, you are expected to behave in a certain way, you can't show your emotion, and uh, you have to provide for your family, and for a girl, uh, you are taught to be submissive. We listened to Dr. T uh, next door, where she was saying, uh, for girls, you actually are punished uh, for just be owning yourself and say no to an adult. Yeah. That's why we have abuse by within families because you are taught you can't say no. And then you hide these things from parents because you are not supposed to dis discuss sex uh, with the elders. So for me, let's just start off the issue, how we raise our kids. I always say, your boy child and your girl child, when you raise them, we need to try and get the best out of what they were meant to be. There's nothing wrong with a girl who becomes a provider for her family and the husband helps and the other way around. So I think when we raise them, the message that is very important is be the best that you are meant to be. There are no role identity, I mean, uh, gender uh, roles when it comes to families. We have to unlearn it because our parents didn't raise us that way. As grandparents, we also need to, to, to unlearn the things that we were taught. Coming to the judiciary, we have a country that is extremely patriarchal. It's not an exception, but it doesn't make it right. Women die with the interdicts. Women go and say, my husband is, has actually abused me. And they say, no, 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 you're too old. Go and sort it out at home. Or it's a family matter. We'll keep it between us. Uh, exactly. I mean, uh, you're hanging your dirty linen, like this NG always says. So I think when it comes to the safety and security of women going to the police stations, they have to be sensitive to say, women and men are equal. Their safety, therefore, is equal. If she comes and leaves her house to come to the police station to say, please help me, take them seriously. Because the point that they don't take that woman seriously is because they see her as less. And the husband being the custodian and the owner of the woman. So I think even before you go to the judicial system, the society has to value us and see us as humans and raise us as such. And I think it also, it also not, I think, I know, it's also about us knowing what our rights are and exercising our rights. You know, um, in, in the session with Dr. T, somebody was speaking about how um, in, a, so in a case, a woman was turned away from an abortion clinic, which is actually against the law, and told to come a couple of weeks later. But then, if you're a young person, how do you exercise the right against authority and so forth? But we need, you know, that, that is also just another journey and, and, and space that we need to get to. One of the, the most important factors of the healing process is forgiveness. And I'm going to turn to um, a chapter called, it's on page 42, and if you don't mind, I, I, I'll ask you to read. It's over here. If you can just give us a bit of insight to where that was, and, and then we'll talk, we'll deal about um, the, the aspect of forgiveness and why it's so important. She said, Rare, her name is William Hill, we call her Rare. 
Re, it is now time to forgive your parents. You have built a lot of anger over the years. That is why you get angry from the smallest things. Forgive Taylor, that is a father, and forgive Kudesh, that is the mother. Both of them dead. It doesn't matter who did what. Anger is a decision. You can decide to get angry and you can decide not to get angry. And then after that talk, she, she points out that I then gave her a lipstick that has a mirror so that she doesn't forget. But let me just explain that this child has even got worse. She is worse. The other day I talked to my sister and How old is she now? She is 19, going for 20. And my sister was telling me that there was an exchange of words because she doesn't want to listen when her grandmother reprimands her. And this grandmother, by the way, is 78. So it's not fair for her to be bringing up this young woman, who is very difficult. So as they were talking, Rene Mokile went and picked up a chair in the dining room. And my sister's got those dining room suites with very heavy chairs. And she was going to beat her grandmother with that. And sometimes when she is angry, she will say, yes, I am bad like my father. And her father killed her mother. So it is anger, and she does not want to go for counseling. Every time a session has been arranged, she asks, who said I need counseling? So we are really, you know, we, we, I, don't know, I don't know what we are going to do. Because my poor sister is really, really battling with this child. And you see, the, the, that's also one of the many ramifications that come from post-traumatic stress disorder. So they, she's still in the denial phase, that she's actually perfect and she's fine, and not seeing the pain that's been inflicted on. Um, for you, Dr. Judy, how important, and we know it's important, but how important is it for families to talk about this and for counselling? I cannot express just how important it is to express how we feel. That is why I was very happy and grateful that this is Angie decided that she's going to share the pain. And the pain will be shared by each member of the affected uh, family. Because when you talk about your pain, it's like you open it up. It's like a, a, an abscess uh, that if you don't just nip it, uh, with the needle, you actually have, have this pus that is just festering in your body. So when you nip it and let it flow, you'll still have a wound, but it will be a clean wound. You can deal with the wound that's clean because you look at it and say, I remember this pain that's clean. So I think not only in terms of femicide, any type of pain we encounter and challenges as human beings, we need to deal with it. We need therapy, we need talking to save spaces because it's not everyone that you talk to that is going to understand your pain and help you to heal. There's something that you always say, Sis Angel, that I believe you haven't dealt with as a country, as a people. We are a wounded nation across races and we haven't dealt with the pain of a party which was so violent. The aggression that we see has a lot to do with how we were raised by the system where it was wrong to be black and though it was right to be white. Can you imagine the supremacy that you are raised to believe you have? just by showing up as a white, just by showing up as a male, I tell you, that is a problem. Because you are not better, just because we are born a boy or white. And now we need to deal with that because all the sectors of society have issues to deal with. Going back to, to, to the issue of forgiveness, so we spoke about the, the, the one tragedy where he was incarcerated. With the, the second tragedy that happened, um, for those of you who don't know, he killed his wife and then he killed himself. 
Where does the forgiveness start there? Because you don't have the person to look at, to shout at, to be angry at, to do whatever. Um, and there's a lot more frustration. It's because it's just, well, you've done this to our family and then you still lived. And, 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 and I'll bring you that section. No, no problem. Um, and another 